Welcome to the Building Hamilton Show with Ken Beacon Dam, brought to you by LegalSecondSuites.com. You're listening to 900 CHML. My name's Rick Samprin in studio with the aforementioned Ken Beacon Dam. Ken, good morning. How are you? Yeah, good morning, Rick. It's another beautiful day here in yeah. Hamilton. Um, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. There's a lot of uh, concern also in our community when it comes to housing specifically. Uh, but there's also a lot of great things that, uh, that we're doing as a city um, to help create more units and to encourage folk to go out there and add these units within their home. So, yeah, it's, uh, there's lots of things that we can be positive about. There is a lot of opportunities for sure. And we're going to get into some of the inner workings of how it all works with our special guest on the show today. George Caetano is the manager of plan examination with the city of Hamilton's building division. George, welcome to the studio. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, hopefully I can answer some of your questions on uh, additional dwelling units. Well, yeah, we're excited to hear some of those answers. I know Ken reached out to you to say, hey, we got to make this thing happen. Ken, good on you to get George in studio to, to uncover some of these answers. Do you guys know each other? Uh, we've talked on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so this is the first face-to-face. -face. Yes, first face-to-face. Nice. -face. Yeah, so, you know, classic, uh, you know, uh, working with the city, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, it's hard to always get in front of a city official sometimes sure. when you're trying to make an application. So a lot of things that are happening, you know, do happen via email or phone calls. You know, yes, the, uh, you know, the third floor building division is open to the public. You can go up there now and, and have a conversation, you know, at the front counter. But still, primarily, a lot of stuff is done over, over email. So yeah, George, great to uh, finally meet you face to face. <laughs> yeah, me too. So George, explain what you do with the city or the manager of plan examination. What does that mean? Uh, basically, my section deals with the review and issuance of building permits for one and two family dwellings, uh, which includes uh, additional dwelling units in the basement uh, or a detached dwelling unit in the rear yard and townhouses. It's okay. basically residential. So someone like Ken uh, from LegalSecondSuites.com will, will knock on your door, send you an email, give you a call to say, hey, I'm thinking about building something, building a project, and you would be uh, the person who would review the application and issue the permit. Well, not personally. It will be okay. my team. There will, we have plan examiners. Uh, they're dedicated staff that have been trained and are qualified to review and issue building permits okay. under the Ministry of Housing. Now, Ken, you're in the industry. Do you find this to be... Uh, an easy venture. I'm sure the city of Hamilton employees are easy to talk to and, 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 you know, organize these sort of things. But in terms of getting applications in, getting them approved, is it easier or is there some challenges? Well, I would say from a, a big picture perspective, it's, it's getting easier, okay. especially when it comes to secondary dwelling units or additional dwelling units. And the big reason for that is because they've made uh, the zoning bylaw easier for folk to to follow and to comply with, right? They've removed some of the, the, the requirements, um, such as unit size and parking requirements and, and other things that kind of help facilitate and to make it easier, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's less, I guess, roadblocks that people come up against. Um, you know, like any um, organization, you know, City of Hamilton is a large organization. There's a lot of staff there. You know, George has a fairly large team. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not always just one department that we have to approach in order to get an approval. Sometimes, you know, we have to go to the planning department or the zoning department. Uh, you know, obviously the building department, but there's also the water department or other you know, parking department, forestry. There's lots of depa uh, departments at the city that yeah. we need to get approvals from. And so, yeah, sometimes that can be a bit challenging for, you know, the everyday homeowner to maybe navigate that that path and who you talk to first. And, and this is where our company, we come in and we help people with that process uh, because we're intimate with, you know, with the requirements that the city wants. Um but yeah, like, uh, so there's, there's, there's pros and cons, right? It, it can be challenging at times, no doubt, but, uh, but a lot of times things can go very smoothly. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, the city has done a lot of things on their end to really help. Yeah. Kind of smooth the road for people to pave that road nice and, uh, flat. So it's easy for people to, uh, to basically comply because, you know, the easier that we can make it for people, the, the higher the, the chance that people will actually choose to pull that building permit yeah. and do it legally rather than not. So just on the inner workings, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but George, your department uh, focuses on one and two uh, family or one and two bedroom family dwellings. If Ken is dealing with a client who already has two bedrooms and is looking to put in another one, perhaps in a basement for a legal second suite, would that go to a different department or would you handle that? No, we're talking when I say dwelling units, the number of bedrooms is irrelevant. Oh, okay. It's the number of dwelling units, which could be two, three bedroom, one bedroom, a bachelor unit. 
it's a dwelling unit which is comprised of sleeping accommodations, a kitchen, what bathroom. That's a dwelling unit. I see. Self-contained. Okay. So that's the way we look at it. So when somebody comes in to convert a basement into an apartment or to a secondary dwelling unit, my section would review it and issue the permit for that. And so this is a multi-unit project, yeah, an, an, an eight-unit facility, townhouses, a condo. That would be a different department. Townhouses, we, we handle part nine townhouses, which mm-hmm. is less than 600 square meters in building area. They'll still be my section. Uh, it's the it's the number of dwelling units inside each. A townhouse is comprised of eight dwelling units, but each one is it's separated by fire separations. So we include that as part of my section still. Okay, interesting. How did you get into this? How did I get into it? Well, I went to Mohawk College. Uh, I'm an alumni, an architecture technology. And from there, when I get out, uh, I thought I was going to be working for an engineer or an architect. Mm. I had two job offers, one for an, arch- an engineer company, and one for Canada Mortgage and Housing as a compliance inspector. And that's how I got into regulations and compliance. And I seemed to I enjoyed that part of it. And then I moved on to the city of Hamilton as a plan as a house plan examiner and basically moved on there. Mm-hmm. Do we need more Georges in the city and, and in other cities? Is there a shortage of you guys? Um, right now, m- more of a shortage. Uh, there is some a bit of a shortage. There's a lot of graduates coming out. We find a lot of turnover. Uh, one is that a lot of municipalities, uh, you have to be fully qualified to be a building inspector or a plan examiner. So you need to pass uh, Ministry of Housing examinations. You have to be, uh, have a, you have to be basically certified and, and be able to do this, this type of work. It's, and it takes a little while to do it. Mm-hmm. So we're finding a lot of municipalities are running low on these type of employees. So everyone's trying to find these people. So mm-hmm. it's a bit of competition. Yeah, that's, you know, and that's something that I've uh, come across as well. Um, you know, our, our firm, we work in about 50 plus different municipalities and townships across Ontario. Um, and it's a common refrain that, that I hear from, you know, especially from the managers and the supervisors that, you know, they, they just have a lack of plan examiners. Right. Um, there's just not enough kind of people getting into that, that industry or that trade, if you will. Um, and because we've had such an influx in you know, housing and building permits, especially through COVID, right? Uh, a lot of uh, municipalities were getting were getting just like so many applicants coming in, and they're they having struggling to keep up. So, um, like like George, last I spoke with uh, Alan uh, Shaw, he's the uh, chief building official. Um, I know that even in, here in our city, that uh, still kind of struggling with with staff trying to get enough enough people in the department, and is that still a a, a problem? Yes, then the turnover is pretty high. A lot of staff that we hired in my section, basically we're at the entry level. So let's say we hire somebody from college, we train them. Then normally they move on to either a plan examiner or a, or an inge- or a building inspector. And because of, there's a lot of retirements also, that's creating an, a lot of turnover. So I've, it's hard to make, sometimes maintain that uh, experience. Uh, we're getting better at it. And I think that's why we developed a dedicated team to deal with additional dwelling units because we want to make sure that's not, it doesn't, it's not over, we don't have, we don't, we basically address that issue instead of trying to deal with it as part of everything else, because there's a lot of things that the staff do, right? Yeah, so I know, and that was, that was a great, you know, step that the city took is creating this dedicated ADU team who primarily just focuses on, you know, secondary dwelling units and additional dwelling unit applications. Um, because, so that way those plan examiners can really just, you really know those policies, uh, the zoning bylaw and the building code in particular for those units. Mm. So when they're reviewing applications, they can do it, I would think, you know, in a much more efficient kind of quick manner yeah. with the hope that, you know, we can turn these around faster. Is that is that kind of the idea? Well, that's the idea for it. We started this in June of this year. We, we have five plan examiners dedicated to this team. And like you said, it's basically to get an expertise or an ex- these employees will become experts on secondary dwelling units in terms of building code regulations and zoning. So when you talk to them or when you come in for a permit or you have an inquiry, it's easy. They should be able to handle that fairly quickly instead of having to say, well, I have to go talk to somebody else or I have to check into it. We are seeing an improvement quite a bit um, based on these type of applications. Uh, we also are developing a dedicated website and uh, some brochures that we have, we're developing right now. We have a dedicated phone number for the team and also an email address which should make it easier for people to contact them to get their questions answered. 
Yeah, like I would say, you know, from the from the private sector here, who's you know making applications and helping uh, homeowners, you know, we've definitely seen an improvement over the last you know the last year or two, especially um, on these particular applications. So mm -hmm. yeah, kudos to the city. You guys are making you know a uh, good effort here to to help the industry and to help everybody you know get these permits uh, issued. Well, that's basically why we did this because of the industry feedback and the concerns in terms of providing housing in a, in efficient and you still make them make sure that they're safe, health and safety is still met under the building code, but they're quickly dealt with and uh, reviewed in a timely manner. We got about 90 seconds in this segment. George, would you say your team is, you know, we're talking about the need for more of these, you know, examiners and inspectors. Is your team short staffed or is it at an acceptable level where you can, you can do the things that you want to do? Right now, with the dedicated ADU team, it looks like we're stabilizing on that side of it, at least. Hmm. Uh, there's always turnover, but uh, having the team dedicated, I think it's helped quite a bit to be able to address the housing issues throughout the city. Okay, when we come back in our next segment, talk a little bit about uh, the, the legal suites that we have in town and that uh, Ken and his team are building and some of the illegal things we come across and maybe some red flags to homeowners or home buyers especially and what they should be looking for. And we're also going to get into, there's been a lot of talk about red tape when it comes to creating secondary dwellings and how we can cut through that red tape and how the city of Hamilton has done just that. Get more out of your home and book a free consultation with Ken and his team today online at LegalSecondSuites.com. You are listening to The Building Hamilton Show with Ken Beacon Dam, brought to you by LegalSecondSuites.com on 900 CHML. George Caetano. George is the manager of plan examination with the City of Hamilton's building division. By the way, get more out of your home and book a free consultation today online at LegalSecondSuites.com. Ken and his team will turn your basement uh, into a basement apartment, perhaps, if that's what you want to see uh, have happen. So we have George in studio today to talk about the inner workings of what happens at the City of Hamilton. For example, when someone is considering putting in a, a Legal Second Suite, and they've contacted Ken online at LegalSecondSuites.com to say, all right, let's turn my basement basement into a legal second suite. We want to get some additional revenue from this space. We want to, you know, help, uh, you know, add to the supply of rental units in town, uh, which is all win-win. When it comes to the legality and the illegalness, if I can put it that way, Ken, I'm sure you've seen some things where you go in and think, how did this even, how, how did this even happen? Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of people, yeah, they'll bring us their property and say, hey, here's here's a space I want to potentially look at adding an additional unit. Um, and so obviously we look at the zoning bylaw first to make sure that, you know, it is in fact a permitted use there at that mm -hmm. location um, and that there's you no know, nothing else that would maybe limit um, that potential, like the need for a parking space or, um, you know, we need a, a means of egress uh, situation sorted out, like we need a deck step or a balcony or something created. So we sort out the zoning stuff first. And then it's really, we're looking at the space for building code compliance. Um, and the number one thing that we look at is ceiling height, because ceiling height is typically one of the more challenging ones mm -hmm. to solve, especially from a construction perspective. Um, so George, maybe you can kind of speak to uh, City of Hamilton and, and their particular policy, especially for minimum ceiling heights and basements for houses, so two units or less, um, for those below grade spaces. Uh, well, that is one of the issues that we do come across because uh, if the basement is not an adequate height, you can't convert it under the building code. Some people have to lower it or do something which is very expensive. Uh, in the city of Hamilton, what we've done is under the building code, you need six foot five under beams and, and ductwork. We went to the national building code and we're using six foot one inch as a policy, which is what also is being proposed for the next edition of the Ontario building code is to reduce that under beams and ducts to six foot one, which should help a little bit in terms of allowing in more residential units to be converted. Uh, but that is one of the main issues right now is if you don't have the proper height under the, it's the beams and duct work because you can't, you don't want to hit your head on something when you're trying to exit the building or exit the dwelling unit. And so, so the six foot one, so that's 73 inches under, you know, a beam or a bulkhead in, in the basement. Now, what about the, uh, the main ceiling height? You're looking basically at uh, six foot eight or that one, 1.95 meters. I, I'm in mean, that trick, but most people are into feet, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so six foot eight is uh, 80 inches. Um, but I was under the impression that there is a, um, that we're following national code for height if, at 77 inches for the main. 
type well, for, for, for two unit houses. Under part 11, you can use some reductions in that. So that's probably what you're talking about. And, and the National Building Code, like I said, it's, we're trying to harmonize the Ontario and National Building Code. And that is a proposed amendment. And it's supposed to be coming into effect the next, it's, until the new code comes in though, we're kind of stuck with the, the, what the code is now. Um, but there is some provision, sometimes uh, a little bit less, if there are certain under certain criteria, but we have to review each individual situation. So I guess yeah, we should be clear that um, under Part Eleven, which is houses that are older than five years old, that we're allowed this this further reduction under code. Is that correct, George? That's correct. Yeah, it's basically yeah. This Part Eleven is for buildings that are over five years a, of of age. It's basically saying that because it's an older building stock, they may not be able to meet the current code requirements. So there's some compliance alternatives that can be applied or used to ensure it still meets the safety requirements of the code, but it alleviates some of the restrictions or reduces it. Yeah, because one of the things that we come across a lot is now that the city is allowing, you know, three unit conversions, four unit conversions, is um, that once we, you know, become three or four units, we're now considered a building under the building code. We're no longer considered a house. Mm -hmm. And our below grade spaces um, actually require a higher ceiling height under under the code, uh, which is 83 inches for that main ceiling height. Whereas for a house under the national code here that Hamilton's accepting is 77 inches for a two unit house if it's older than five years. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So um, that can get challenging for people, um, especially trying to do those triplexes or those fourplex conversions, those converted dwellings is what we're calling them here in Hamilton, um, where they now, yeah, they have to get into lowering that basement floor because a lot of these older homes don't necessarily have that uh, 83 finished height. Right. So we've talked about rules and regulations a lot on this show, and there's a lot of rules and regulations George, would it not be simple just to say have, have a standard for everyone? Um, well, there is a standard. It's the Ontario Building Code. Right. Um, what do you can? It, it has. It sets out all the rules in terms of means of egress, in terms of building height, in terms of unit size, uh, minimum room sizes. It does have it all there, and that's why we're trying to develop a brochure that simplifies it somewhat. Hmm. So instead of someone have to go through two thousand pages of the building code, <laughs> we hopefully can give you a summary in terms of sample drawings or some information up front saying this is the what you have to look at. Instead of saying here's the building code, go through over every section, we'll summarize it in terms of for a two family dwelling in the basement, you look at this, this and this. For a secondary dwelling unit in the backyard or a detached one, these are the items you should be addressing. So we're hoping that will simplify it or at least make it easier for somebody to follow along. Yeah, like what we've seen in, in our experience is that, you know, when people come up against a roadblock with something, you know, if it's a building code requirement that they maybe can't comply with, or if it's a zoning requirement that they come up against, um, oftentimes it's just, it's a, it's a lack of knowledge around the requirements, right? right? And yes, the, the building code act is a very big binder, two big binders. Uh, you know, the zoning bylaw is getting bigger and bigger. You know, it's not getting like in the 1950s, the zoning bylaw used to be one little thin little binder. Now it's like really big. Um, <laughs> It's too big. They have to put it all online, right? So, oh. um, but it's, it's kind of a lack of knowledge just around the process, right? And so, um, like, this whole education of the general public on how to go about it the proper way, um, what are the basic requirements that we need to meet? Um, on our website, you know, we've, we've put together a checklist, uh, legalsecondsuites.com slash checklist. It's a kind of a, from a high-level perspective, kind of walks people through the basics of what they need to be be considering, you know, mm -hmm. ceiling height, room sizes, natural lighting, parking requirements, zoning bylaw requirements. So like we're trying to do our part to kind of help people narrow in on the most important items that they need to be considering. Mm -hmm. So apart from, we've discussed ceiling heights, apart from ceiling heights, what is the most common uh, issue that you encounter when you're going into someone's home? Um, yeah, the, well, the biggest uh, item that we see, especially now as we're getting into the uh, the tri and fourplex conversions, like these um, higher uh, number of units within the within the home, is, is really it's it is ceiling height, but also means of egress, um, and that's getting more challenging with the tries and fours because, like George, uh, we were talking uh, before the show. Um, right now, under the building code. You know, uh, a house is only defined up to two units. And once we become a triplex or a fourplex, we're considered a building. 
and the requirements for means of egress change quite a bit, which can make it very, very challenging to kind of get these units in. So uh, I think there is talk, like George mentioned, um, that they might be amending the building code uh, definition of a house to include up to three units, right? Is that correct, George? Uh, yes, we had a uh, meeting last week with some of the ministry staff, uh, and uh, that's, you know, they're talking to us about any the proposed amendments, and that concern is brought up by the building officials that there should be a consistent inter definition of house, that it should include at least at least up to three, because that's what the province is kind of mandating is three units as of right. So it makes sense to have a, a house definition that matches probably the provincial direction. But there is discussion at that level to do something under the building code. Mm -hmm. Um, so, George, what are common things that you guys see on the city side when it comes to illegal units in this city? Um, and maybe you can speak to, you know, what are what are the, the steps that you guys do as a city to try and, um, you know, make these homeowners, I guess, come into compliance with their illegal unit? Well, illegal units, uh, the, the way we find out about them is two ways, either by someone complaining or by uh, proactive enforcement. We have a dedicated team of building inspectors who are enforcement inspectors, and they go around the city. If they notice some construction, they'll usually knock on the door and say, what's going on? And then they'll describe if they're doing a secondary unit in the basement, they'll explain to them what they need to do to come into compliance. Um, we try to, first of all, try to deal with it in a, uh, basically just getting information out and telling, asking them to get a permit. If they don't, obviously there's enforcement, but we try to avoid that right away. We try to get voluntary compliance which seems to work the best. Uh, a lot of issues, the problem there is that once they did the renovations, the pr uh, they may have problems with ceiling height is a big one and exiting and means of egress. And they may require an egress window and they may have, con they may have a problem putting that in if there's insufficient side yards or if there isn't sufficient space to do it. So the main, uh, like saying, from a point of view from the city, uh, we try to be proactive to an extent and we try to educate the public as much as we can once we get out there to ensure that they know what to do and what to, what steps to follow to get a permit. Yeah, like in in, uh, in my consultations with, with uh, clients, you know, because they're asking me like, you know, should we pull a building permit or what's the benefits of legalization versus not being legal? Um, and there's there's lots of benefits to why somebody should make it a legal unit versus not a legal unit. And Rick, we talked about this previously on the show. Um, the biggest advantage to having a legal unit, especially a legal, you know, income suite, like a basement apartment, is that it's a source of legal income, mm -hmm. right? And this can really help a homeowner, you know, qualify for a mortgage for their home. Um, it can help help them qualify for other things in their life that they need you know, income qualification for. So, you know, having it as legal income is very important. Um, but then number two, being being compliant with the city, and, you know, make, being, keeping the neighbors happy, yeah. right? Keeping the city off your back. Uh, so you're not getting, you know, knocks on the door and saying that, hey, you know, you have to go out and fix this. Um, and trying to do things after the fact rather than before can actually cost a lot more money to try and fix it after mm -hmm. the fact. And I've seen that lots of times where people have already existing finished basement apartment. Uh, they get that order to comply because a neighbor complained or the city came knocking. Um, and now they have to undo so much of the work that they just finished um, to make it code compliant. And so because um, the city is making it easier, you know, from a zoning perspective, you know, we're seeing reforms happening in the building code although that takes longer to come uh, to fruition, but they are making efforts to make it easier from a building code perspective. It's getting easier for people to do it. Um, and again, it's it's an education thing. It's a knowledge thing around the process. You know, I've created, you know, hundreds and hundreds of legal apartment units now over the last, uh, you know, four or five years that I've been in, in this industry. It's not as hard as people think it is. Mm. Um, but you do need to connect yourself with the right people, the experts, um, you know, proper professional designers um, to really help walk you through that process. And that's something that we do advise people is early on, just if you have some, if you know, don't know how to do a drawing or what you're looking for, you may get want to get a contractor or a designer that understands the building code and what has to be done up front or talk to us because a homeowner can do their own drawings, but we find sometimes they're a little, they're not familiar with the building code or the regulations. So it becomes a little harder for them to follow along. Uh, but the other thing to add is I, it is to, to legalizing the unit 
also makes it help, safe for the occupants of the building. So I, I agree, it's it's a, they're making income, it's legal, but it's also for the health and safety of the occupants of that unit. That's what my main concern is. If there's a problem or a fire or something, they can get out of that unit and they're not living in a, in a, in a, in a unit that's not healthy or safe. We've, we've heard a lot of horror stories when it comes to home renos, contractors who don't really do the work that they should be doing, or at least doing it, you know, from a legal standpoint. When your enforcement inspectors are going out in the community, are they uncovering issues frequently? Is it infrequently? Is it kind of once in a blue moon? How, how many times are they going or coming back from a job site or some home reno that is just not, they haven't, you know, pulled a permit? Well, there's quite a few of them. It's not like uh, every day there's a, a, a lot of them. Right. But there are issues with ones that we do find. Like I've been inside some units uh, with some of our inspectors, and the, the, the way they're living, it's, it doesn't, it's not safe for the occupants. Hmm. Either they don't have a proper exit, they have locks on doors that they shouldn't have because you have to be able to get out of the building. Uh, there's mold in the basement, like things of that nature that we're concerned about. Is uh, it's not every day or every a lot of them, but there's enough that there's a concern that you know just call us, deal with our ADU team. We'll ensure that we'll put you in the right path to to get a permit. Like no, hundred percent. Like there's a lot. I I've walked through hundreds of buildings and houses in this city, um, and you know there there are a lot of places that, that you know have been well built and well constructed. They just so happen to not pull the permit, mm. but. There's also a lot of stuff that is completely unsafe for, for people to live. You know, um, some of these older houses, downtown Hamilton, some of these two and a half story century homes, you know, we have these uh, property owners that have kind of like over the years, you know, and some of the stuff can go back like decades and decades ago where people had kind of put in these kind of, you know, quote unquote apartments in these, in these spaces. And yeah, like really low ceiling heights. Mm -hmm. Um, no fire separation, no proper egress, like they're fire traps. They're complete fire traps, like wow. poor electrical. Like, so I can, you know, obviously, um, appreciate and, um, really, you know, value the city's effort to kind of crack down on some of these, like the city of Hamilton has like thousands of illegal units. Like it's, it's a dog's breakfast out there as mm -hmm. far as, you know, legal versus not legal. And, you know, Hamilton's a very unique city. It's, it's got a lot of character to it. Um, it's a, it's a rapidly growing city and yeah. So along with that comes, you know, just a, a big mess out there of kind of yeah. legal versus not legal stuff. And so. I'm sure Hamilton's not alone in that too. There's obviously other communities who are struggling with this uh, dilemma yeah. as well. We're getting into the uh, legalities and the inner workings of uh, what happens at the city. And we've talked about cutting the red tape. Politicians have talked about cutting the red tape. We need to cut the red tape at the municipal level. Is there a lot of red tape to cut? Well, it depends which side you're looking on, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a politician, yeah. George? Maybe, yeah. Classic. Classic. <laughs> so what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, the thing there when you call red tape, uh, let's say zoning bylaws, mm -hmm. uh, building regulations, uh, there's a lot of applicable law issues, um, but that's something kind of outside. We just, from our building division point of view, we're just enforcing those items. Right. Uh, whether the city, and the city has reduced some of the red tape by, well, the province has directed it under Bill 23 to allow three dwellings as of right, mm -hmm. three units on the property, one in the basement, one in the rear yard, and your, your common one, so you got three. So there is some, they reduce the number of parking spaces to zero on those ones. You don't need parking spaces. So there are working towards it. The thing that people think it's the red tape is when you start talking about, well, you need fire separations, you need means of egress. Those are regulations to ensure the safety of the public. Mm -hmm. You can reduce some. The problem there is you get to the point that you can't reduce all of them. Then you'd have buildings. People just basically be like the Wild West. People would just be building whatever they want. Yeah. And then there'll be no set of rules. And I think that's not the proper way either. We can, and that's what we listen to the industry to design professionals, contractors. If they have a valid concern on something that we're doing, we'll pass it along. Uh, I agree with what's been said before. The building codes takes longer to change, but the zoning or city policy, that's something that can be done a little bit quicker, provided there's enough um, enough push to do it. Mm -hmm. Ken, have you encountered that red tape? Like when you, when you have a project in front of you, and let's just say it's a basement apartment for argument's sake, how long does it take for you to pull the permit, get, you know, the okay from the city and then go do what you got to do? 
Well, yeah, like there is, there's definitely a process and a step-by-step process that we walk through to, you know, try and get a permit uh, issued as efficiently as, as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when it comes to red tape, like a lot of, uh, a lot of issues come from, I guess, what I like to say, outdated zoning bylaws that don't necessarily reflect the current environment that we're in. Okay. Right. Um, there's some, what I, what I call like glitches in the zoning bylaw where, you know, for instance, um, you know, from a parking requirement, let's say, you know, here in the city, they've, uh, essentially removed parking for, uh, you know, secondary dwelling units and additional dwelling units. Um, but if you read through the bylaw closely, um, you know, anything built after May 12th, 2021. So if you have like a v- fairly new home, you still require a parking spot for that SDU. Mm. Um, and so some of these newer subdivisions that have very tight lot frontages, the homes are very close to the street. You know, some of these people, they have a nice town home there, but they want to put an SDU in, they need those two parking spaces and, you know, it triggers a minor variance, right? right? And so to me, that is some red tape that we come across where it doesn't make sense because how come everywhere else in the city we don't require a parking spot, but just because this house so happens to be built after May 12th, 2021, we need a parking space. And now we have to go through this, you know, expensive minor variance process. So like there are some stuff that, you know, I think there can be some housekeeping amendments done that the city can undertake to help kind of clean up some of these what I feel are are inconsistent bylaws that we have. You know, another one is the fact that we're not allowed detached ADUs in the rural zones in this city, right? Like out of anywhere that you could possibly put a detached ADU, our rural zones have the most amount of space Mm. for them, right? And, but, you know, we have policies here that we don't allow them here in the city. We only, we only allow them in the urban zones. Um, So there's a lot of work that the city can do to help, you know, on that front kind of, uh, clean up, make it fair across uh, the city for these, especially for his secondary dwellings and in, in ADUs. Um, but again, it's it's a lack of knowledge around the process. When people hit a red tape or they hit this roadblock, it's because they probably haven't hit that roadblock before. And then they get all frustrated right. and they have to, you know, take a couple steps backwards to kind of figure it out and, 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 and come up with a solution to that problem. Um, so this is where the importance of really working with professionals who've done it before, who've been through, who've been down that road multiple times before, they know what to expect. Um, I was talking with George um, off air about this, uh, this four unit converted dwelling project we're looking at doing in downtown um, Hamilton. Um, and one of the, uh, the building code requirements requires, um, you know, a certain width for a means of egress, um, not just internal in the building, but also outside. Mm. So let's say you have a side entry door on your home, you know, you need a certain minimum width there to be able to exit properly and get to the, to the street. George Caetano. George is the manager of plan examination with the city of Hamilton's building division. Now, you were talking about a story about, you know, building a, a safe egress both internally and externally on a project you're working on. Yeah, so we're looking at doing a four unit convert, uh, converted dwelling. So four units in a two and a half story century home downtown Hamilton. Um, and part of, so this this homeowner, this property owner is, is bringing this property to us to take a look at. Um, and, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, walking them through the requirements and say, Hey, look, you know, your property, you are, you know, you're like two feet to the lot line. You know, like some of these houses downtown are very, very tight Tight, to each other. Right. Um, and, and there's a, an existing side entry door to get into the, the basement. Um, but you know, he wants to convert that basement into an apartment while like that exit width or that, that distance from that side entry door to the property line we couldn't meet the minimum width under the building code. And so, you know, but thankfully we know these requirements. And so, you know, we informed the property owner that this is an issue, this is a challenge. Um, And so we could, you know, we worked with them. We worked with uh, city staff as well to look at other options uh, and come up with a good solution to be able to, you know, enter and exit that building in, in a safe manner. You know, if you think about it, you know, if, if you only have two feet between your house and the lot line, like emergency personnel can't get down the side of the house safely to mm-hmm. be able to get into that unit, right? Um, but, you know, if this homeowner didn't know the requirements or they weren't working with somebody who does, and they were just kind of going on their own to the city, applying for a building permit, and then they get these review comments back, and this comes up as an issue, like 
this is where people think, oh, it's a roadblock. It's red tape. This is they get frustrated. You know, they they throw their hands up in the air and say like, why even bother? You know, all this kind of stuff. Right. And so um, again, it's kind of a it's a lack of knowledge around the code, around zoning bylaws. Uh, and this is why we're here. We're here to help educate you guys out there, uh, be able to do this easily, efficiently, and and make great, safe legal units. George, how nice is it to have, you know, a team like Ken and, and his team at LegalSecondSuites.com in the community, kind of spreading this message and making sure that people are doing things legally? Well, I think it's a great idea. It's a great thing that we have. And we do recommend to people to talk to a professional that's done these before. I agree with what Ken's saying that, yeah, people sometimes get frustrated because they think they can't do it hmm. because someone told them they can't do this. Talk to us. Call our ADU team. Sometimes there's more than one option available. And I think that's what people don't realize. It's, yeah, you may not be able to do it this way. Let's work together to see if there's another way of approaching it or complying with the regulations and still making sure that it's safe to the occupants in the basement or in the backyard. Um, but I think it is a great idea to, we tell people sometimes, get a design professional or a professional that understands secondary dwelling units because they are unique in a lot of cases. It's not like building a new house. There's a lot of, things you're trying to make it work in an existing building that doesn't comply with the building code already. So we're trying to make it fit. And, and this is something that, again, I, I give a lot of credit to the city for the, the hard work that they've done over the last, you know, six months, a year, um, to help make it easier for folks. Um, like I said, we work in lots of different municipalities. So I come up, you know, working with lots of different types of building departments out there filled with many, you know, different types of, uh, folk. Um, and some cities are not very helpful to their community helping them, whereas other municipalities are very helpful. Mm. Um, and I would say Hamilton is one of those municipalities that is very helpful. Like you can always go to the third floor building division. You can go to the fifth floor planning division at City Hall. You can ask questions. You can get answers. You know, they have special email addresses set up to answer your questions like the, e the ADU team. Um, at hamilton.ca. There's zoning inquiry at hamilton.ca. Uh, these are email addresses that you can send in a question. I do it all the time. When I'm trying to get clarification on a zoning bylaw or a building code issue, I can email the city. Usually within a, a day or two, I get a nice, clear, concise response, um, which helps clarify the requirements. So um, yeah, great job. Uh, great job to the city. We got uh, 90 seconds, George. We know that there is a housing crisis in this community. Are we... Are we in for a big change coming up, either in terms of a lot of permits being pulled or a lot of skilled trades people coming into the community and saying, hey, we want to build? Are you expecting to be very busy in the next five, 10 years? Well, from what we've looked at in the last little while since we have allowed three dwelling units, we have seen an increase in an uptake in the number of permits. And that's why we created this dedicated ADU team. We saw the light at the end of the tunnel almost. It's increasing the numbers. And uh, there's more people that want to be able to create these additional dwelling units both for additional income because of the housing cost and also to provide housing to people who need it. And we're in the middle trying to make sure that we sort this and provide the service and provide the review as quickly as we can. But there is, a, like I said, we're trying to address the need, which is not just in the city of Hamilton, it's across the province, but yeah. we, feel, we feel it here in the city quite a bit. Ken, you guys might be really busy too. Come come a few years from now? Well, look, there's a lot of challenges out there, you know, um, right at the point in time where we need so much more housing, the cost of building housing is skyrocketing, yeah. right? Which, which, you know, we've seen it in our office. We've seen a big slowdown actually in the amount of applicate or uh, people reaching out because they simply can't even afford to undertake the renovation. Even oh. if they wanted to, they can't uh, financially. So there are some some bigger, you know, economic things we got to sort out, too. But. We can tackle that on the next show. Yeah. Uh, you've been listening to The Building Hamilton Show with Ken Beacon Dam, brought to you by LegalSecondSuites.com. My name's Rick Samprin. Big thanks to George Caetano for coming in today from the city of Hamilton. Uh, tune in next month when we bring you another edition of The Building Hamilton Show on 900 CHML.